Welcome back to chapter 7. Today we're going to look at section 7.4 which deals with arc length and surfaces of revolution. And our objectives are going to be to find an arc length of some smooth curve and then we're also going to find the area of a surface of revolution um, as to where in section 7.3 we are looking at the volumes. So let's begin by looking at arc length. We can actually use definite integrals to find um, arc lengths of curves. Now what we're going to do is we are actually going to take some curve and we're going to break it up into tiny little line segments that are all going to be straight lines and if we approximate the lengths of all of these and add them together what we're kind of doing is we're we're kind of using the distance formula and if you recall from your previous math classes the distance formula is equal to the square root of the quantity of your x um, coordinate points you're going to subtract those square them and then add that to the difference of your y coordinate points squared as well now a curve that has some finite arc length or a set length that you can measure is called a rectifiable curve. Now a stipulation for finding the arc length is that we have um, some function whose slope, because if you recall um, f prime here is actually the slope of a curve, that slope has to be continuous on a set interval um, or the interval that you're looking at for this to be um, even possible. Now we say that the function is continuously differentiable on that interval if um, its graph on that interval is a smooth curve. And again, if you look at our graph, this is just some curve, y equals f of x. Okay, and we're going to take that curve and we're going to break it up into all these little line segments here. Okay, and we're going to divide that by n number of line segments and um, you can see that each of their endpoints are going to be like, we're going to start at x0, y0, then we have x1, y1, x2, y2, and so on. We know that if we want to find the distance between um, our change in y here, then we're going to just subtract the y values. If we want to find the distance between the x's, we're going to subtract the two x values, and so on. So we actually have coordinate points that we can find the distance of each line segment. Now if we add up all of those line segments, we will actually find the length of that entire curve from A to B. So the definition of our arc length says that the arc length of a function f between um, two points A and B is going to be given by s, which represents arc length, which is equal to the integral from A to B of the square root of 1 plus f prime of x squared. Now if you recall, f prime of x squared is really the slope or the derivative of our function. Now for a smooth curve that's given by some function that says x is equal to g of y, we're going to do the, we're going to take the same approach to find our arc length except now we're going to look at our interval from c to d for our integral and we're going to take this or take the integral of the square root of 1 plus that g of y function and take the derivative of that and then square it. And we're going to take that and integrate it with respect to y. So let's begin by looking at our first example. We want to find the arc length from x1, y1 to the point x2, y2 on the graph. And the graph is just some function f of x equals mx plus b. And if you look at our figure down below, this is what our graph looks like. Now if you recall, the slope m of a straight line is really equal to the derivative or f prime of x which is really equal to y2 minus y1 divided by x2 minus x1. So we're going to use that piece of information and we're going to plug that into our equation that we were given that says s is equal to the integral. Now my a to b in this case is going to be my x1 to my x2 value so I have x1 to x2 times, or I'm sorry, we're going to integrate the square root of 1 plus f prime of x squared, and I'm going to integrate with respect to x. So what this gives me then is the integral from of x1 to x2 of the square root of 1 plus y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1, that quantity is squared, and then we're going to go, <clears throat> sorry, integrate with respect to x. Now to simplify this, 
when I integrate, uh, first of all, let's simplify this stuff underneath the radical. I'm going to have the integral from x1 to x2, and that 1 right up here is really, because I want to get a common denominator, that's really going to be x2 minus x1 over x2 minus x1. So I'm going to end up with, and all of that's being squared, so it's really x2 minus x1, the quantity squared, minus y2 minus y1, the quantity squared, all of this divided by x2 minus x1, and that quantity squared, dx. When I integrate, I end up with, oops, I'm sorry, the square root of the quantity of x2 minus x1 squared minus the quantity of y2 minus y1 squared, all divided by x2 minus x1, that quantity squared, and that dx is now going to become an x, because when I integrate dx, it gives me just an x. So I'm multiplying that radical by that x, and we're evaluating this from x1 to x2. If I break down my square root, um, and I do the square root of the numerator divided by the square root of the denominator, I can't simplify the square root of the, or the numerator because of the subtraction sign there. I do apologize, this up here is supposed to be a plus. So if you take a note right here and right here, those should have both been a plus. So let's go ahead and continue on. Breaking down the numerator and rad or breaking down the radical, we have the square root of the quantity of x2 minus x1 squared plus y2 minus y1 the quantity squared. If I simplify the denominator and I square root that, that's going to give me just the quantity of x2 minus x1. And then I'm multiplying by this x value, which is being integrated from x2 or from x1 to x2. So if I plug that in, I'm going to go x2 minus my x1, so I really end up multiplying this whole thing by x2 minus x1. Now what's going to happen is these here are both going to cancel out, and we will be left with the square root of x2 minus x1 squared plus y2 minus y1 squared. And if you recall, this here is your distance formula. So we just proved that the length of that line segment by using the square root of 1 plus our derivative of the function squared is really equal to the distance formula. Next, let's look at the area of a surface of revolution. Now the definition says, if the graph of a continuous function is revolved about a line, the resulting surface is called a surface of revolution. Now we're going to find the area of this surface of revolution um, from the formula for the lateral surface area of the frustum of a right circular cone. So this right here is a right circular cone, and we want to look, if you notice, we have some length L, Okay, this is the length of the cone or the line segment, and we're going to have two radiuses. We have our R1, or our smaller radius, and our R2, which is our larger radius. When the line segment is revolved around um, an axis of revolution, then we get this right circular cone. Now to find the lateral surface area of that, we're given this equation here that says S, or the lateral surface area, is equal to 2 pi R times the length. Now because we have two different radiuses, we're really going to use the average of the two radiuses, or R1 plus R2 divided by 2. So even if my graph slightly changes, I can still use the same approach. So now if we look at this curve here, y equals f of x, and I take this, and I'm just, remember, I'm looking at just several different line segments to create my L. 
So if I take this curve and I revolve it around um, the x-axis in this case, then I'm going to get this type of an, um, an image there. And the equation for finding the surface area is given by capital S, which is surface area, is equal to 2 pi times the integral from a to b of r of x. And remember, r of x is the function of our radius times the square root of 1 plus the derivative of the function squared, and we're going to integrate that with respect to x. Now, this right here, if you recall back from the previous, or the beginning part of this lesson, is really the length of a line segment. So I have our radius times your length of the line segment. Okay, and it doesn't matter which, um, which way you're going to integrate this, whether you're going to integrate it with respect to x or with respect to y, the function will still be the same. So our last example says to find the area of the surface formed by revolving the graph f of x equals, and this should be x cubed, on the interval 0 to 1 about the x-axis. Now there is a figure that goes with this. This is what our image is going to look like once we revolve it. If we want to find the surface area, remember surface area was equal to 2 pi times the integral from 0 to 1, or in this case our a to b, of your r of x times the square root of 1 plus f prime of x, and this will all be squared, and then we're going to integrate with respect to x. So now I just have to identify what my r of x is and my f prime of x. So let's start out with f prime of x. I know that f of x equals x cubed, so f prime of x must equal 3x squared. r of x is really equal to the distance from my axis of revolution to my function. And if you notice, I'm revolving around the x-axis, so this distance here is really going to equal my f of x. And f of x was really equal to x cubed. So now I have my function, or my f prime of x, and my r of x, so all I have to do now is go back and plug everything in. So my surface area is equal to 2 pi times the integral from 0 to 1 of my r of x, which was x cubed, times my square root of 1 plus my derivative squared, which is going to give me 3x squared, and I'm going to square that quantity, and I'm going to integrate with respect to x. Now if I go in and I rewrite my radical as a power function, we have our surface area is equal to 2 pi times the integral from 0 to 1 of x cubed times 1 plus 9x to the 4th. And I'm going to raise that to the 1 half power and integrate with respect to x. To integrate this, we're going to have to use u substitution. So if I go in and I call u my 1 plus 9x to the 4th, then my du is going to be 36x cubed. Now because my x cubed up here does not have the 36, that means I'm going to have to divide my 2 pi by 36 to offset that. So to do that, I end up with 2 pi divided by 36 times the integral from 0 to 1 of my u to the 1 half times du. So now when I integrate, my 2 pi over 36 is going to become pi over 18, and u to the 1 half is going to become 2 thirds u to the 3 halves. And I'm going to evaluate this from 0 to 1. So pi over 18. I'm actually going to bring that 2 thirds out up front as well. And I really, in my u, I might as well substitute back in, is really 1 plus 9x to the 4th. And I'm raising that to the 3 halves power and evaluating from 0 to 1. 
when I plug in my 0 and my 1, I should end up with sorry, pi over 27 times 10 to the 3 halves minus 1, which is approximately equal to 3.5. Six, three. And that concludes section 7.4.